Thank you, Katungu. And welcome to all who are with us. Um, this is a little bit out of the ordinary um, in that we normally only have one webinar a month, uh, and uh, but we wanted to feature this particular webinar um, in April along with the other webinar that we had last week because of uh, the importance of the issue that we're going to be working with today and um, because of the special guest that we have uh, with us, which we're excited to interact with. So welcome each one of you and thank you for taking the time to be with us uh, for this webinar. And if, you're, if you find this um, conversation very stimulating, as Kajungo has said, we will uh, record this and, um, and pass uh, uh, and, and upload this webinar in its entirety uh, on our website and it can be shared uh, and listened to by others. Um, we're very excited to have um, Vanessa Wesley with us today. And, and Vanessa is, uh, I'll introduce her in just a bit, but she's gonna be talking to us about community police um, partnerships or community partnerships um, in, in, in the Chicago area. Um, and so, uh, we want to we want to take a look at that with her, and um, I don't think I need to say a whole lot about that theme, except that it's a it's a it's a it's a hot theme. We all know that you 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 can't be in this country in the last few years, two years or so, without knowing that this issue has come to the forefront in many different ways. Police community relations, and there are many differing views on this, and we're fully aware of that. And the restorative justice movement is needing to figure out how do we continue to have conversations across many different institutions and communities and divides. Mm -hmm. So um, community justice partnerships was specifically chosen as a title uh, to, to open up that conversation and say, um, we're, we're opening that, that table, that restorative justice table, so to speak, to have this conversation, sometimes hard conversations. We know there are voices within the movement saying, we need to run parallel, not work with the institutions. Some saying we have to work with the institutions, some saying on certain conditions. Uh, and so policing and community relationships is really a critical relation, um, issue. And I think it's very relevant to um, our restorative justice movement at this time. And as the Zare Institute, we've been trying to facilitate these conversations in a number of different ways. One of them has <coughs> to bring together police uh, officers and um, and leadership that has been working with restorative justice in different parts of the nation, get them together. Um, and also, uh, we have an upcoming online course, which you'll hear more about in this seminar, uh, where we're going to be looking at policing and restorative justice. The webinar is going to be called Law Enforcement for Restorative Justice, Peace Building in the Community. And it will be um, it will be an online course, not just a once-off webinar. It'll be running from June 28th to August 2nd um, in this year, 2017, and it'll be from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our hosts for that course will be Kurt Bossart, Lieutenant Kurt Bossart from the Harrisonburg Police Department here locally, and our guest uh, for today, Vanessa Wesley. So if you want more information about that, feel free to visit um, our website and look at that. Let me just introduce um, Vanessa for a moment here, and then I'll be turning it over and you'll be able to hear her voice and her story, stories. Officer Vanessa Wesley is a 25-year veteran with the Chicago Police Department. She began her service in community policing in 2004 under now retired First Deputy Dana V. Starks as project man manager in the department's uh, CAPS project office. And she'll talk some more about that possibly. She has also served as project manager for the Mayor's Office of Faith-Based and Community Partnerships. Currently, she is a program manager for the Chicago Police Departments and the Metro YMCA's Bridging the Divide program, um, an innovative program trying to bring a uh, new understanding, new relationship and new connection and partnership with the police and the community in the Chicago metropolitan area. She leads the community engagement training program for um, the department um, through DePaul's University for Urban Education. And uh, I'll let her add to these connections however she wills. Vanessa is a restorative justice and art of hosting practitioner and trainer. 
She's been trained by none other than Kay Pranis in circles. Um, and um, she has uh, um, a lot of experience, as you can see, as well as a contagious energy about her work. <laughs> so we're really happy to have you here, Vanessa, and, and welcome. And I, and I turn it over for you to give us a little bit of your story and experience. Thank you for being wow. here. I never been called contagious, Carl, but I'll take that from you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I, I, I really am grateful for this opportunity just to kind of share my story um, about this journey that I kind of fell into, right? Um, in 2013, we began the changing or trying to see how we can improve our relationships with community in Chicago. At the time, our superintendent and our mayor had noticed that we have had successes with community policing over a period of 20 years, but something was missing. We didn't have the response. What was really going on? And after some analysis, it came to light that, you know, our city had changed, our neighborhoods had changed, but our processes have not. So one of my assignments was to look at that process. How do we improve it? And the reality of it is, is that we really did not, we did not change um, with our neighborhoods or, or our situations and our relationships didn't change. So we didn't have those successes. So we went um, and sought the help of our wonderful friends over at the Egan Center, um, Mr. John Ziegler, um, Anton Seals, how can you help us? And they had been over some years providing professional development for schools and um, people who work with young people in the area of how to properly, authentically engage community. Um, it was very eye-opening. We um, did a pilot for over a year with community policing officers, and we co-created this uh, curriculum, uh, specially designed for law enforcement personnel. My apologies, it appears like we've- uh, and, and sometimes that we, we, we could not, unfortunately, seem to reach or have relationship. So to that end, we found an opportunity or we were approached by the YMCA. You spoke about the Bridge of the Divide process. And in 2013 and 14, a lot of very tragic things happened with law enforcement and community. Um, that resulted in some some deaths of some some individuals, and unfortunately, we weren't prepared, right? So, with that, the YMCA has a program called Youth Safety and Violence Prevention, and the that that network or that organization or that program, I'm so sorry, really catered to the needs of justice-involved youth or street organization-involved youth. And what we found was one of the things that was paramount was to keep them safe. And they were having a hard time expressing how unsafe they felt in their own communities or when they made certain decisions. They were afraid of the organizations that had continued to uh, recruit them, but the unfortunate part, but the more important part, they were afraid of the police that were there to serve them. So um, the leaders of the program at the time, Ryan Holland and um, Eddie Bocanegra said, well, what can we do to bring police into the room? What can we do? I'm sorry, folks. It looks like we're having some connectivity issues um, with with the line, and uh, we'll try to see what we can do to work that out. Vanessa?
folks, I'm sorry, we're going to have to figure out how we've lost Vanessa uh, at this current moment uh, in this. So I'm going to ask that we um, that you bear with us as we try to figure out how to secure uh, an, uh, a better online connection uh, with Vanessa. I found my way back, I think. <laughs> Carol, can you unmute your screen? Carol? All right, Vanessa, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we we lost you completely. So I don't know if you're on a secure line for the, on the internet right now, Vanessa. I think I am. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure at which end. Let's continue. Um, but Vanessa, if you don't mind, sorry, folks, for for this. Could you give us a phone number just in case we have some complications in the next few minutes? Sure. Send um, that through the email to um, patients or myself. That would be great. Sending now to patients. All right. Okay, and you need to open up your video then once you've sent that out so we can see you again. And we'll try to give this another roll. Uh, so it says start video. Yeah. Okay, there I am. Hey, sorry. Bye. <laughs> I feel like I've been interrupted for an emergency service broadcast or something. Yeah, that's what it feels like. And, <laughs> and I apologize to our participants who um, have been patients through this process. Um, Vanessa, I don't know if you can remember where you were at. You were right in the beginning of telling us about the partnership with the YMCA. The YMCA. Yeah. And, well, really, and, and the what, it is, what it is, Carl, in a nutshell, is really asset-based community engagement being manifested through the partnership with the YMCA. The idea of partnerships is that we can't do the things that we want to do by ourselves, and we can do more together than we can do separately. That's why at this stage of our, our CAPS, or Community Policing Revitalization for the Chicago Police Department, is really, really being intent on how do we create partnerships, how do we 
maintain those partnerships and are they true partnerships? With the YMCA, we had, you know, in them a partner that helped us to design. We had them in the partner as implementation. So, you know, we all really pitched in to see the success. And because of that, it was able to grow from a project to a, a process where now is policy for the Chicago Police Department, a written policy that we will institute using restorative practice and art of posting to build relationships with communities of youth. That process has even grown past our communities of youth where we have uh, we expect, uh, conversations in community about how we can impact change. So even when we host these meetings or host these, these gatherings, we never host them by ourselves because we realize the value of co-creation and co-implementation. There's the sustainability factor that, that is always an issue when you have just one entity that's doing all the work or you have one entity that's responsible. And along with that is the issue of a lack of accountability. We, you know, we talk often about what the community doesn't want or what they won't do or what they won't commit to. The reality of it is, is like any of us, we're not going to commit to something that we don't co-create. If I don't have the stake in the matter or if I don't see where my self-interest is being addressed, then I'm easily, you know, swayed to something else that attracts my attention. When it comes to public safety, the most successful models is the inclusion of the communities that they're impacting. So when we created Bridge and the Divide, it was created intently with the partnership of community organizations. We're here now two, uh, two years, three years later, and we've now expanded from three communities, well, I'm sorry, three districts and about six communities to where we're now in nine districts. We have a superintendent that's pushing us to create a bridge and divide presence in every district, right? Because everybody needs to understand how to co-create with police and things that concern them. And the larger picture is the, the, the change that happens. How does community change when all of the participants are at the table? It can't be a issue of public safety with just police because unfortunately we can't guarantee public safety in and of ourselves. Things that we don't have control over have to be addressed. You know, as much as I wish I had the answer to poverty and, and unemployment, I don't, not in my skill set as a police officer. As a police officer, I know how to enforce the laws that are already established. But the issues that we're finding in communities with crime and chronic disorder is a lot more than just those people doing or people doing things that are against the law. It's so much to go into it. That's why we need the help and the assistance of community around us. We are not, it's not the, um, the law enforcement and the community. We belong to the community. We are part of that community. So we have to be in lockstep and arm in arm with those folks that we serve. And Bridge and the Divide is an example of that, where you know we intentionally have um, community organizations that partner with certain districts and certain district offices, along with the young people in the neighborhood, and they create their bridge and divide process. Um, our end game, although we have a, we, we do our most work in circle and it's hard for people to move out of that warm, safe space, but we also utilize the art of hosting of how we generate wisdom, collective wisdom for change. Young people understand the things that they need. They understand where a lot of times, you know, you get my age, you, you, I'm no longer bilingual. I don't understand what our millennials need or our young people, or our generation Zs. We have to have them at the table. We have to collaborate. And we have to admit that they know some of the things that we need to create this change. So partnerships really is the foundation or I would say authentic partnerships where we share power and resources it is really the foundation for any of the successes that Bridge and the Divide has now experienced. Wow, Vanessa, wow. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. And I, I have a lot of questions and I'm sure some other folks probably do too. So let me remind our participants, if you have questions, feel free to type them through the Q&A. Um, button icon at the bottom of your screen and and we'll be taking those in a bit. Vanessa, let's continue the conversation. Um, 
one of the things, just go back a little bit. You had a lot there. I'm gonna I'm gonna pick a few things out. You're using a language of safety, I'm hearing, a mm -hmm. lot more than crime. Tell me mm -hmm. about what that shift looks like, because you immediately talked about safety of everybody. In other words, mm -hmm. the young people are talking about, they're not safe either. Even those young people that we may have labeled as at risk are not safe. Mm -hmm. so talk to me about the shift in language to talk about safety. I mean, I know that this is, is, is catching on in other places, but when you start to talk about safety and security in the community, how is that mm -hmm. than just talking about crime? So when you think about um, crime, we think about um, intentional instances, right? Where you have the statistics of um, events or occurrences, yet, you know, you can have a, a low number of those, but you still don't feel safe coming out of your community, coming out your front door. So safety is really the perception of the person that in the community that this, these activities are impacting. And our young people, unfortunately, a lot of them are in this space or they, they are in that environment where some of these um, not so safe things happen. And sometimes it can be in the middle where it causes them harm. But if you did not have the actual activities, if there's not a mindset that they feel safe walking out of their front door, then we need to look at what has to happen for them or anyone to feel safe. I don't know how I would feel if I had to think whether I'm going to the grocery store or not, right? So I think about young people who have to go to school, right? They have to, there's a social development that's being stifled because of this, right? So the idea is that when we talk about safety and security and we talk about the safety of young people, more so than criminal act that they may or may not occur, we have to be intentional about creating spaces where they can speak to that. What is it that they need that they feel safe? Right. So yes, crime is an issue, but correct, you know, crime, you know, the idea is that we really want young people and community to feel safe in their neighborhoods. Absolutely. No, this is this is really important, and I'm appreciating how you're beginning to, you know, uh, lay out the, the way in which you're looking at it. It really is a world view. It's a perception that really, but we have to shift the language too, and we have to shift the action. You know, in other words, what you're just Describing now is 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 very different than just saying um, I'm going to be a little bit antagonistic here. But you know, mm -hmm. when you hear about the the super predator, which thankfully we don't use anymore, or you know, stop and frisk. That's what we've got to do in order to keep the crime down, or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's very different. Than mm -hmm. saying, how do we make sure everyone who lives in this community feels safe? And there's some people who can't leave the community. Mm -hmm. And they have to get to school. They have to get to the grocery store, and they don't feel. Right. Safe. How do we? You know, that's that's a really important, I think, shift in language and perception on what it means to be community. Well, you know, it absolutely is, and I think that the reason that that term got so much attention, it was the people who were using it. It was an easy term, and it began to shift culture of what people perceived of what was actually going on. So to that end, I would say that we have to be intentional about that language and be intentional of identifying our young people as the human beings that they are, right? How do we continue to look at each other for our humanness, right? Not for some label that was created out of fear. I believe that label, um, you know, and somebody, feel free to correct me, came out of a fear and an opportunity. And I think what we found is that it created a landslide of cultural shifts that ended up creating these um, overran prisons or the way we started looking at young men of color and being, because we were looking at them out of fear because of something that someone else said. When a lot of these young men and young women are just teenagers and we begin to criminalize them for being teenagers. So, I'm glad the shift has happened and it took eight years mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, policies to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But we have to be very careful because it's so easy to slide down that slippery slope again and begin to blame folks um, for the condition that they're in instead of looking at the actions that have occurred. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's, in, in full transparency, I think um, that term, super predator, came out of academic research, not from the ground, not from folks okay. in the community. And, um, and, and it, it took political hold, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I, I believe the, the part that I'm aware of is the political hold. 
Yeah. And just being very, you know, putting some things together just from reading, who benefited from that? Yeah. Right? Who, who, you know, grew from that? So, again, it was, you know, it was like a social construct, if you will. Absolutely. Now, I think um, if, if I was one of the particip participants, I hope I'm representing them well, I would really like to hear a little bit, how does this work? I mean, you've talked about bridging the divide and this partnership with the YMCA, and you've talked about um, art of hosting. I think if, 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 my, if the participants are like me, I don't know exactly what that looks like and what you do. So we'd love to hear, you know, the nitty gritty of the detail of, of what does that mean. And um, when you talk about written policy, so there's two parts here too, that, that is now affecting so many different districts and so on. What is in that written policy and what kind of um, things are you requiring of, of the police and the community in this, in this partnership? So bridging the divide, the process, um, really what wanted to meet three criteria. The first is to deal with the feelings of um, mistrust um, with police and young people in a certain geographical area. This is not something that we wanted, you know, it wasn't a room with 50 to 500 people. This was a attempt to create safe space, well, not even safe space, but create an opportunity for officers and, that serve in the community and the young people that live in that community that interact with those officers to build relationships one instance and one opportunity at a time. But in order to get them, we had to be able to create an atmosphere that they would want to come to. So once they found out about the circle process, once we um, introduced that and really set the, as, as we've all been trained, the, the, what Kay has taught us about creating a space based on values and guidelines that we all set, that everybody's voice is important. Your truth is not, you're not to be judged. It's okay to speak your truth in those spaces. Young people began to gravitate simply because no one listens to them. There's not a system, even in some homes, is, you know, your kids, stay in the kid's place. But when you're actually listening and value what you're hearing from someone, now they feel affirmed. They feel appreciated. So yes, they began to come. And similar to young people, police officers are, are um, beat officers, are entry level officers. Their voices are not always heard either, because in the in the paramilitary, you know, we're at the bottom of the rung, you know, the ladder. So we just do what we're told, and to for their voices to be heard, especially with the community of youth, because it feels like it's us against them, then they, their dynamics or their lenses begin to shift. That's where change became, trust became possible because we were in a space using the circle, the restorative process of circle to be able to have those conversations that we wouldn't ordinarily have. So the idea is that you move from a healed place or healed enough place to have impactful and effective dialogue. How do we do that where it doesn't just become uh, adults telling kids what to do or kids, you know, making some demands that we know that we could meet. So the, the, restore, the art of hosting process of World Cafe is a simple participatory public dialogue process that allows conversations between people that's impacted by the, by the solutions that we're trying to find. What we're finding is that a lot of the things that we're trying to create in, in different academia settings or different corporate settings or, or higher echelon systems is that, you know, we're trying to solve problems for people who have not been brought to the table. So what the World Cafe process does is it allows for people to come and you see this synergy of collective wisdom begin to rise. The, you know, we sometimes we forget that the wisdom is already in the room. Some of us are in positions to help bring change in social service, and that's good. But the, the beginning of that change really starts with the people that it impacts. So how do you create a space for people to see that capacity? And World Cafe does that. So how do we get young people and officers who are just on the beat to co-create change? 
and we set these up and it's like a speed dating if you will or speed networking kind of process but we're intentional about the questions that we need to ask to begin to generate the wisdom the conversation ensues across the table about well what do you think about this well what about that oh i didn't think about that can we work together to get that done absolutely so now you have this synergy that's not automatic but it's there and once the synergy is activated now you have young people co-creating their change where does that actually happen right yes we're responsible for their welfare but you have officers working with young people to see seek solutions to the things that we face every day does it happen overnight absolutely not does it is it always 100 percent? it does it's not 100 percent all the time but is the potential there absolutely so we take the collective wisdom and we create things they co-create things that they're willing to work on co-creation also brings co-accountability so whereas a system we have always taken responsibility for the things that need to change what co-creation does it gives some of that responsibility to the people who have to sustain that change as a system as a police officer i work in the community eight hours a day i'm going home how do you build capacity within community in this case the community of youth to make the changes that they need and sustain them because I'm only there a certain amount of time. So I love the healing space of the circle process into the intelligence gathering and wisdom harvesting of a world cafe or a public participatory dialogue. Now we create a platform that public safety, the public safety of young people is being discussed, talked about, and looked through a looked at through a different lens by those of us, those people in the department that make you know policy. So we like to create leaders out of these young people who want to be there. We want them to come with their voices and speak to their issues and their concerns in the room with adults, which you're not, you know, they're not allowed. Um, I'm not sure about you and your family when you were growing up, but at Thanksgiving we always had the kids table. You had the adults that go and sit in the dining room and then you, you know, you got the card table somewhere in the basement in the kitchen for the kids. Well, we're shifting that. We like to see the kids at the main dining room table. So when there are issues about what do they need, they can actually articulate these are the things that we need. These are the things that we think we would commit to. So we'll quit creating programs and then having to go find young people to participate in them. If they co-create it, they're responsible and they're accountable to show, to see if, the, you know, to see it through. Um, and then have this ongoing. Are we there yet? No, but we still, <laughs> the journey continues. Um, and we've seen some successes, but this is a learning journey. It's not something I can tell you. Here it is, cookie cutter, you can put it wherever. But the journey is just as important as the end result. that makes sense to you that does so let me let me just recap a little bit are we you so you're using circles and and if i understand correctly there are times when you also um as part of the orientation for the police officers they are now required at least in the districts you work at to sit in circle with youth for a certain amount of time can you talk to that a little bit sure so what the policy or the the dot the, and i'm speaking of the our general order that talks about what bridging the divide is it really is a description of that process i just described mm -hmm. this gives the um opportunity for staffing for folks to be a part of these conversations because they're important they are community engagement that is required as a police officer that you do participate in community engagement processes because we do adhere to the philosophy of community policing. Um, the idea is that they, we give them a opportunity to have these conversations and sit in these spaces while on duty. So the order kind of helps with the operational process, if you will. Um, we wouldn't mandate people to sit in circles because that's not the process of circle. You don't make people sit in circles. It, then it loses what is authenticity as being restored. It then becomes punitive, right? If I'm making you show up, then you are you really benefiting? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I would say we provide opportunities for them. And there has not been a time where we have not received, we have not had officers mm -hmm. to sit in these spaces with young people throughout the different times that we've done it. Mm -hmm. So that order is to describe it. 
introduce um, restorative law enforcement strategies, which in a nutshell is just the alternative to doing what we've always been doing. It's, you know, you, a lot of people will say, oh, that's just diversion. Yes, it's diversion, it's discretion, it's whatever we need to try to find options to what we're already doing in a restorative manner. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, that's 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 really helpful, um, Vanessa. And, and there's a lot in there, and I I would love to hear um, you talk a little bit more about um, some of the kinds of activities that the youth and the police are co-creating on. Can you give some ideas of like what might come out of these spaces where you're doing uh, the World Cafe? And if you want to describe the World Cafe process a little bit more, you're welcome. Certainly. Well, you know we we don't go into this cold, right? Um, and we go with it in this design with the express intent to make sure that these are events that both police officers and young people will want to attend. So when we think about um, the things that happen, we've had, um, we've had basketball games, which is to common. We've had designed we have co-designed obstacle courses fun courses that 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 have occurred we've had culinary competitions we had a gourmet sandwich competition that we had young people and officers to participate in and they competed just for bragging rights right um so in the circle at one point we begin to explore you know our common interest we explore things that we have in common we have opportunities for you know some live tracks to be developed of spoken word because we have poets that are police officers and we have poets and spoken word artists that are young people so the uniqueness of this is how each district have the opportunity to see where the common interest lies and begin to galvanize and bring people together around that for the i would always call it the first date that's what you know, my officers, they, they laugh at me. I'm like, when you first meet somebody, you got to check them out, right? So let's create a space where they decide, mm -hmm. oh, okay, you're all right. I think I can sit with you. Um, and mm -hmm. then let the process goes from there. The World Cafe process, um, thanks to the Wisdom Exchange and Next Generation of Leaders, really began to teach me that it, the, the, the value, the, I'm sorry, the importance, right, um, of allowing people to co-create space um really having true authentic voice that we can't start doing service doing community to community but with community right and these spaces are created and sustained by people themselves you how do you really begin to initiate any process of change unless you're able to sit and have a conversation and and World Cafe does that. It's not your meeting. It's you know where you go and you have people who sit in front of a room, and then you have the rest of the folks looking at the people, and you and the people you like. Well, why don't you fix this, right? Where is the co-ownership in this space? So World Cafe really addresses the ability to have co-ownership, co-co-creation, um, and co-accountability, knowing that if we do that then there's a better chance of sustaining it, right? Because, you know, systems are wheels, right? Things change. Budgets change. They're the first to go. So when we have to shift that, how can the work be sustained unless we built the capacity of the people that is impacted? And the World Cafe is like the beginning of us being able to do that. Wonderful. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm very, this is really, this is really, um, thought provoking for me. I, I, I like what you said about co creation, co ownership, and co accountability. Uh, nice categories. Also, the shift in power. I think that mm -hmm. must be critical to your process because, you know, when you talk about not to the community, so, so, so often um, our policing has been to the community. We've, we've been, pro, the policing has been, you know, done to the community, not done with the community and mm -hmm. that's a that's a that's a real shift in 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 where does the power lie How, what what mm -hmm. power do we centralize in this mm -hmm. and um and i think that that obviously takes a mind shift uh, a bit of a mind shift thing too uh, so can you talk a little bit more about what that um our police officers um 
are they getting this? Is this totally brand new? Is any of this coming out of the academy? And, and what happened? How do you work with the, the shift, you know, in, in the mindset? Maybe even tell me what's your journey, an incredible journey of 25 years through this in your sort of change. Because even community policing, while it's, it's, it's a great concept, we know that at times it, it's, it's run its course and folks have said, mm, that didn't feel like community, you know? Mm. So, so how do we, how are you redeeming those processes in this? Any, any, any stories you have to tell or your own personal journey in that or, or what, your, what your vision is to see where this, where this could, could continue to take us? Well, it is it's the ever evolving, right? Every, you know, week um, we do, we see another level of growth. So what on, on the whole idea of the paradigm shift, I think policing in general, is really at a place where it's different, right? It's not the same that it used to be um, 10, 15, even, well, really even five years ago. So you, with innovation and, and the landscape change in communities, you have to change with that. However, when it comes to bridging the divide, you realize that you know we need to start really with our new officers. What does an authentic community engagement looks like? So that really goes back to our asset-based community engagement and also coupled with our superintendent's mandate that we not look at community policing as a program, but as the way that we police. So we're not the, the system that just do stuff. I, I was just talking to a group of people today. I said at one point I felt like I was a Burger King police. Whatever you all ordered up, that's what we did. And after a while, when those resources ran out, where, how do we sustain that unless we have the, the ownership and the commitment of the people that we serve? So to that space, my journey has been watching the openness of, or of, of a very old, um, I won't even, that's not nice, but <laughs> a very, um, how can I put it, a very rooted system as it, as it as it is with our criminal justice system but it's interesting because there's fissures and cracks in all of it from the way that we uh process juvenile offenders to how you know we are looking at how they're treated how we're tre how, how we're looking at adult offenders so it's like there's this major overhaul going on in this in this system to which policing is a part of we are the gatekeepers to that um, so what's our part? And, and our part is really how much do we play in the initiation of, of that system? How can we change what we do to where it's more holistic, it's more participatory, it's more collaborative, yet also create a space of sustainability to continue that work? So my journey is, is, is still evolving. I'm still learning. Um, I, we're not there yet. I just, I really just don't believe that we can stick a pin and say, hip, there it is. Because yeah. something, you know, there's so many different moving parts. So we stay, cons we try to stay consistent. We stay intentional. Um, you know, every time there's a, a opportunity to host a circle or train somebody in that place, because we realize that unlike other systems, Chicago really uses the circle process to build relationships. So whenever some things break down in community or there's a communication gap, we go straight to the circle process. Case in point, it's, it's, it's funny when um, there's some incidents that happen and we had a district to mobilize. They're like, well, we need some circles. So, you know, we had circle keepers there and they organized in, in, in cooperation with community opportunities for some of the conflict to be aired in that space of circle. We never had that tool before. And that's what we're using that for. Or, you know, we needed to get community input. Instead of having a town hall, we now have a World Cafe-like um, dialogue where you did not have a dais or you did not have a keynote that began to, and that was the only voice you heard because change don't come from just one voice. So to that end, that's how our journey, my journey personally, is really evolving. How much more I can learn a part of hosting? How can we see different things that we can do differently? If nothing else, can we create options? And, you know, our, our previous way might be the way to go. But if it's not, it's good to know that you have options. Absolutely. Wow. 
fantastic. I, I, I love the, the, also the language shift of saying, and this is from, I think you said those above saying, this community policing is no longer a program. You know, it's an add-on program, one more, you know, your, your Burger King policing or whatever you call it. It's a <laughs> process, it's the way we do. It's the, it's the actual container that we do our work in. Yes, sir. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's fantastic. Um, um, so I'm gonna I I'm gonna keep asking questions unless <laughs> I'm gonna call out, call out to our participants um, where are the questions you have um, and and please please um, jump in and start using our Q and A time and we'll take your questions live as they come in and I'll read them out to Vanessa and Vanessa will be able to give us um, some of her thoughts on that and we'll continue the conversation that way so I'm inviting questions at this point. Uh, in the schedule. And as you're putting those questions together, Vanessa, I don't know what else you would like to say. I know you had some photos of your work. I don't know if you want to talk to a little bit to some of those um, or if you have uh, um, another direction that you want to go. But I'm, I'm particularly, I guess, a question that still lingers with me. I mean, there's many, but one that I'm particularly picking up on is your optimism. Your, 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 you know, even just what you recently said in just now before we 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 broke on was this idea that i mean i'm putting words in your mouth now so correct me if it's not, <laughs> not what you were saying but it seemed like i heard you saying you know our system is not working uh, um anymore it's imploding in many cases and we've got to come up with other ways to do what we do and um and and so this is part of that work and so you're you're seeing policing on the precipice of some changes uh, in yeah. your mind. And, and I'm, that's exciting to hear. And I think that might be, we don't always hear that. We don't hear that on the news and, and our whole system, our whole criminal justice system needing to make um, significant change if it's going to survive. So um, I'm gonna turn it back to you if you wanna make any comment on that and some of your pictures. It looks like I've got a few questions coming in. So while you talk, I'll look at those and we'll keep the okay. conversation. So one of the things, and early on, again, uh, we, I shared that a lot of this work came from this, the work that we were learning or the process that we were learning about asset-based community engagement, looking at communities for who they are and their value um, instead of their problems and issues, right? And then how do you build capacity on that? And, you know, with um, the DePaul University really looking at you know, this is derived from the asset-based community development model um, made, you know, universally famous, right? How do you take that out, how you address chronic, and cr chronic crime and disorder? So to that end, we, you know, the pictures that you're seeing is the beginning of actually we had gathered with community. This is at the end of one of our trainings that we have for the officers. We invited community to really sit with us and say, okay, let's take this problem, let's identify an issue, and let's co-create a strategy. And out of this conversation with, you know, we heard from communities that really, you know, these people sitting at this table never sat together. And they never sat together in a way where they were actually addressing the issue. When, you know, sometimes the problem solving model can be a bit overwhelming, the Sarah model, but here is just dialogue, you know, and you're finding or you're seeing, you know, wisdom show up in a way because we gave them a certain issue that they had identified in their in the five districts and said, so what can we do? So you had business owners at the table, you had school officials at the table, you had, uh, you know, law enforcement at the table. We had a couple of people representing the, you know, all the medic officers. So. What does that mean? We are in this together, right? There's not one entity that's more responsible for the changes we want to see than any other. So we wanted to see if it worked. Could people come out and feel comfortable in this? And what we found is yes, they did feel comfortable with it. They did feel like they had learned something. But even more importantly, you have relationships being built between people who generally, oh, they're going to kill me because I showed y'all this one. <laughs> <laughs> you have relationships being built between people that generally just pass each other, right? You had, you know, they're like, wait a minute, let's stop, let's talk about it. So at each of those tables was the epitus or the beginning or the genesis of new wisdom or, or, or new collective 
movement that was never there before. Ideas that they probably entertained, but never had a chance to implement. They went from creating of ideas to implementation, and out of that came one um, one initiative, which was No Talking While Walking, where you had community and policing walking down 79th Street telling people to be careful with their Apple products. And I mean, it wasn't a big budget, but everybody on that team owned it. So you had from the um, the you know school people to the block club leaders to the faith everybody worked to one goal and we could you know the commander said that he saw a drop in robberies on that beat by 34 percent so co-creation works um how do we get it to be mainstream how do we get it to be um where it happens naturally it may take another generation it took caps a generation to work or I'm sorry, community policing when it was new to work. We just have to stay committed to the process. Beautiful. Um, there's some questions that have come in, so let me jump in and um, field a few of those questions if you're willing. The first one's coming from um, uh, Deborah Kittle asking, how do you train your circle keepers or circle keepers and World Cafe hosts? Can you talk a little bit about the training? Uh, who, who, who does the circle keeping and, and the hosting and how do you train them? So we have been so graced um, in this process to have concept partners. And two of those partners are people that you and I both know, love and appreciate are um, Aura Shu and Cheryl from um, Community Justice for Youth Institute, Cheryl. which are, Cheryl Graves, who yeah. really actually started this movement, were very I would say, instrumental in the start of the movement of restorative justice in the Chicagoland area. Um, the introduction to the World Cafe process came from two people, um, Lena Kramer and um, Renee. And the, I think it was, I think Renee's company is Next Generation for Le uh, of Leaders. And then Lena Kramer, who's a um, art of hosting practitioner, trainer, um, policy advocate. She signed on with us to help us learn how to process. How do groups come together to change? So these two entities really trained us initially in how to do the process. We've since created a, a cohort of trainers in each practice, and they still shadow and make sure that we do it right, um, of how to train the circle the four-day model that um, Community for Justice Youth Institute has, does. And also we have a team of World Cafe Institute uh, facilitators, how you teach people to understand what that particular discipline is for um, and then how to actually harvest the wisdom, what to do with it afterwards. They were very gracious and shared all that wisdom with us. So now when we do it we're, we're looking at along everything else and how do we train our community partners to do this with us um the circle process we is going to be a part of what we try to train young people to do because we believe i believe for sure and our our team believes that if young people had these had the opportunity and these skills that a lot they could probably mitigate some of the conflicts that they have so the idea is that we do a force multiplication and then we create um, in leadership young people who take these skills and apply it just like it was given to us. So we are in the process of, of scheduling another institute. So we try to have at least uh, a circle training once a quarter, a cafe institute once a quarter, when time and resources allow. Wow. Wonderful. Along with that, um, Christina Weiler, or Wheeler asks, first, thank you. This is such an important topic. Uh, so um, she says she really appreciates, loves the concept of World Cafe, especially with difficult topics and mm -hmm. vulnerable populations. Um, she says, my work focuses with children mm -hmm. and youth. Have you used the model with this population? And again, thank you. Um, actually, I've, I have not done it personally. Um, the youth that we work with with Bridge and Divide are from the ages of 13 to 25. So um, we kind of thought that 13 would be the age that they could actually um, hold the conversation 
you know, with clarity and understand and be able to sit long enough. You know, that's that's something that could be a concern. Um, however, there are models and there are schools that use the process with young children, you just have probably have to have an incredible amount of patience and someone who could understand how to communicate with young people just so to hear what their ideas are. Um, I've not done it personally, uh, but I have sat in circle with, with grammar, uh, elementary school young people. Uh, I am a, a restorative practices coach. So in schools where we're trying to create restorative practices for how, you know, just to combat some of the push out issues that public schools are facing. So how do you create restorative communities and atmospheres within schools? So to get to your point, that age group, it is possible. And I, you know, that's not the primary goal for Bridging the Divide, but we do work with schools that are restorative schools that have restorative coaches. Um, Nehemiah Trinity Rising, which is a restorative justice organization here in Chicago who focuses on the school population and just working with them and making sure that the practices, the teachers have those skills to have day-to-day check-ins. They have those skills to have restorative conversations that don't necessarily end up being arrest situations, right? Or suspension situations. So there's ways, I mean, I, I see the, the practices of RJ showing up in some of the most interesting places. And it's time. It's time for us to get back to what we know is true, is that we're all interconnected and not one of us can really survive without the other. Fantastic. And I think just to talk a little bit about World Cafe, and there are different versions of it, but um, they sit in circle, but there's a particular prompt at which they're working at, and they, and they, and they develop um, a response to that prompt. And then they shift. I don't know, Vanessa, if this is how you do it, but we, they move from table to table. Yes, Everyone yes. that an opportunity to interact with a particular issue at each table. And then we anchor the table with someone who's a facilitator, who's sort of keeping track of the conversation and isn't moving from table to table. That's so that's... That's a description of a pro-action cafe, not necessarily a world cafe. Yeah. So here's the evolution um, as, as we have grown to know it. So the world cafe is really the introduction of the topic, right? Introduction of the things that people care about. And so how do you have these um, conversations with people who are impacted by the same issue? And it's similar to speed networking where you start off at one table with one group of people. You try not to have more than five people at a table, and that's including the table host. And there are prompting questions to generate wisdom. They're generally questions that are in succession that you know really identifies the issue and then give opportunity for people to see how that issue impacts them. So what ends up happening in a regular world cafe, you usually have three questions, but it's, it's very intentional on the harvest. And what the harvest is, is a collection of information. We, if you look at um, the picture that I have up there, very similar to what that is, it's a large piece of paper with some very colorful markers, some refreshments, and a lot of space and opportunity. So people can begin to, you know, really begin to write down or share things that they think are, are pertinent, their ideas, their one word or one sentence ideas. And, and we begin to, we harvest those reflections, right? We gather them um, and you can't see them, but we use those same types of paper to put them up on the wall, right? Take a look at them. Do you agree with them? And then at that point, you know, we create a report and send to everybody that participates. Does, does things happen in one cafe? I'm sure it could, but generally there's a couple of them. The process you described is like the next level, right? The evolution, which is called a pro-action cafe. So out of those ideas that come from the, you know, the initial conversations and gatherings, you bring those to the people and say, okay, so what's important to you? What do you really want to work on? There's, thus, you have people who come and they become callers, right? They as we post, um, there's usually like two different times of about 45 minutes apiece. If I'm concerned about youth employment, then I call the conversation. I'll be that person sitting at that table, you know, just really, you know, gleaning from the wisdom of the people who have gathered there around youth employment. The table next to me could very well be um, the education system. So another table can be housing. Who knows? As a as a pro action cafe, kind of opens the doors for those things that you care about 
to actually, you know, get the wisdom of the communities that they impact. So people come and they sit and you talk about, you know, they have suggestions, you know, even with Bridging the Divide, I learned so much and being a, you know, when we were first designing it from a few pro-action cafes that I attended, you know, from ones in Oak Park to some, you know, I was actually in Wisconsin and I, I called the subject, how do you get youth and police together without conflict? Right. And I had people sit down with some amazing ideas and I jotted them down. I took them back to my team and we implemented some of those. So this is stuff that does not happen because we're so busy. This is how you gather people and collectively and, you know, this for this collective impact. Right. Collective efficacy. These buzzwords that have been surfacing for the last five years. This is what we, this is how they, we find them in action. And we've learned a lot. And, and I think it's obvious, but let me make the obvious. The difference between this and the town hall, the meetings we're oh, all God. sitting through, <laughs> is that <laughs> yeah, one person's talking to a bunch of people and then may yeah. have a Q&A, but that's it. How, so we're looking at how to bring the voice, the community's voice, into these processes. And that's what you've um, harvested as you use that word. I like that word so nicely in this process, Vanessa. I have a few more questions here. Jessica Hawthorne says, "How you said earlier that the process has been a learning experience. Mm. Can you share some examples of the quote unquote teachable moments, we call them <laughs> aha moments, that you have had in the process? Well, my, first of all, just the acknowledgement of the resilience of our young people. Um, it, it never ceases to amaze me. I, I can't imagine um, living some of the lives that they do. And they keep coming back, right? They want to live. They want to survive. They want to be, you know, they want a future. Um, so that, but then I think the realization of my issue with adultism, I tell everybody I'm recovering um, because I was raised in that gen, you know, kids are seen and not heard, don't do as I do, do as I say do. But, you know, just acknowledging of the voice. Um, I think that was my, one of my, you know, teachable moments when it comes to advocating for young people. Their voices are important. Um, and yes, they are young people. Yes, we've outlived them. Yes, all to all that. But yet when they have a voice and they speak, they deserve to be heard. Um, even if it's hard, right? So my teachable moments is really, uh, validating, right, and affirming that the wisdom that's growing in young people, they need to be heard and it needs to be acknowledged as well. I'm still learning. I am still learning. Um, and I guess I should document it <laughs> one day, but the, the reality of it is any journey that you accept is a learning journey. And this, you know, happens to be one, and I'm not on it by myself. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we're learning more and more about what we could do better, and more importantly, what we can do together that we can't do separately. Thank you, Vanessa. There, uh, there's another question. There's still the Q&A is open if someone else wants to jump in, but I'll take this um, question I still have here yet. And again, it's asking you to do some, um, they're really wanting to hear your, your reflections. So let me say um, two parts to this question. Uh, can you say a bit about the challenges you face from other officers and how you've worked with them? Um, it, well, change is always a challenge, right? Um, it's hard to move within a system that's bigger than you are, but it's not impossible. Everybody don't share the same viewpoint. So for me, I just embrace and accept those who do, and then maybe the others will come around. Um, but that does not, they're not coming around, does not stop the success. Do we have to have every officer with a restorative mindset at the Chicago, all 13, 5,005? No, that's not going to happen. Yet, if we have the majority to even begin to think differently about their options, um, then I think we can count that as a success. We may not get everyone in a circle conversation because some folks just don't want to be that transparent. But if we get one or two that allow those changes to happen in young people and communities and relationships to be built, 
then we'll take that. So, you know, sometimes we, I'm learning that when people measure and, and decide what's good or they uh, decide what's a success, the reality of it is, is that it's hard to measure. And, um, but then we have to also determine what's the meaning of real success. So I'm still on the journey <laughs> I'm, and I'm learning as I go. I have some phenomenal, it's not just me. Oh, I, I got to tell you, I have, you know, there's, there's this, 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 this thought process or this paradigm is not one that I hold my own. We have some very um, intentional officers who are serious about the changes that they want to see before they retire. And they believe that the process of restoring um, people and restoring the process, they actually work. They've seen it work. So, yes, they want more. So not to my credit, but that the fact that it's just true. And then a second part to what made what motivates you to practice RJ in your work? What gets you up oh. in the morning to do this? What's your motivation? <laughs> Um, my 20 year old son, um, I can only imagine if he ever made the mistake that there'd be a, a space for him to have a second chance. Um, and it's possible. He's a human in the, on this earth. That motivates me first and foremost. Um, the resiliency and the intentionality of police officers who get up every day wanting to see the change, wanting to be the change that you know they took this job to um communities that survive communities that grow if i could just be a little more helpful right if if it takes me taking another course or reading you know howard's books again you know um to you know introduce a different way that has not necessarily been promoted as it could then that motivates me Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm going to, um, there's just a little bit of time here um, before we close off the Q&A time. Let me just say um, one more question, and I'm imagining you're being asked this. It's relatively new, so um, it's not at all about um, putting you on the spot. Has there been any efforts to try to measure uh, yeah. what you're and is that in print or is there access to resources around that so that we, is there and and what's that process been like well you know again the the bridge and the divide process is what we are saying that is what is asset-based community engagement looks like right how do you measure relationships how do you measure um just that you know community engagement what does that mean and and because that's an, an evolving um body of work how do you measure is not something that you know that's going to change so our research and development department um larry Sachs, i was working with depaul university and looking at creating i think what he called a dashboard um to see how can we capture those things that haven't been captured right we know how to quantify how many shot how many lived and all those other kind of things but we can't quantify the things that don't happen how many times that a quality the quality of life has been restored. How many times, how many um, circles have prevented actions because of an argument? You know, you, you just don't know what you don't know. And what does that look like? So how can we expand the um, measures of success to be inclusive of, but not necessarily countable? There are some things that you can clearly quantify and count. Um, like how many people will sit at one of those tables or how many young people sit in circle? How many people want to be, how many want to uh, use circles as a process in their life? Yeah, we can count those things that might suffice, but the real fruit of it is yet to be realized. Uh, so I know they're working on something similar. Sorry, that's not my wheelhouse. I hate statistics and I hate numbers. Sorry. But, <laughs> but to the end, um, Will I continue to try to provide folks stuff to count? Absolutely. Y'all can figure out how to count it, um, then go right ahead. Um, so I know that's in the work. I'm not certain about anything else, but you know, Carl, you're right. Nationally, they, they searched high and low. How do you measure community engagement? Well, how do you re measure relationships? And then when you do that, whose lens are you looking through? 
what you said. So you have to be, I guess you got to be careful. Absolutely. And this is a ongoing Sorry, there's a lot of things out there. This is an ongoing challenge for us in the field. Yes. Large. Um, how do we measure this work? Because it's qualitative in many ways. Yes, mm -hmm. there are quantitative aspects, but it's very qualitative. And as you rightly said earlier on, this is generational work. You know, we're working, we're mm -hmm. thinking decadal change and mm -hmm. you don't easily measure that. You don't pull stuff out of the hat, so to speak, um, and put it in your briefcase and say all is well. It's, well, it's, what I do get is somebody running up to me and say, hey, Miss Wesley, when do we have in one of those circles? When the police, when are the police coming again to sit with us? Or um, we had a series of basketball games because, you know, basketball attracts people. But before that, we would have circle conversations about the relationship between youth and police. And because we realize that one off is okay, but it's not what we want, we have four. So when a, a, a young man who has had experience in, in um, being in the justice system, when that young man says, you know what, I can play, play basketball all the time, but I want the conversation. When are we going to sit and circle more? We need to extend that. You can't tell me that's not the success. Right. And I'm not going to, I put it this way, I'm not going to allow you to. Now, I don't know where you need to put it in the, in the little category. I don't know if, if that's what you need, then, but you can't tell me that that's not working from a, a person who didn't want to have anything to even, you know, ran from the police just because they could. So now mm -hmm. I want to continue, you know, I feel good enough and safe enough to say my piece. I'm not going to let you take that from me. Yeah. So. Thank you, Vanessa. This has been uh, a fantastic conversation. I've really appreciated it, and I, and, I, and I hope all those who are with us have also felt the, the vibe and, and the pulse and the power in, in your fierce passion for this work and, and, <laughs> and, and your steadfastness in, 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 in making incredible changes uh, where you are. Um, I'm going to say just a little bit here. Um, Howard was on and sent out um, a, a message to all the panelists, but I want to make sure everyone got it. The World Cafe approach is included in one of our little books of restorative justice. Yes, it is. It's included in the book called Little Book of Cool Topics for Hot, Cool Tools for Hot Topics. Sorry, Cool <laughs> Tools for Hot Topics. So if, if folks want to get something in writing, look a little bit more at these processes, that would be one place to go. Um, I want to ask whether uh, in our participant world out there, cyber world out there, whether um, Kurt Bosshart has has joined our, our universe or not. I have. Hi, all right. Kurt. Fantastic. How are you all? <laughs> We're doing great. Good. Um, so, Vanessa, if I, I'm going to ask you to... Um, hit the button at the top of your screen that closes down your viewing of the of the photos if you if sure. you don't mind. and then we'll pull up some of the final announcements as we come into the last part of our, of our program. Sure. Thank you. Um, we're getting this screen up and so hold with us as we get that up and we're going to go into a little bit of time with um, looking at some further possibilities to engage with restorative justice in various facets and the work that we do here at the Zare Institute and the Center for Justice and Peace Building. But also, um, we've invited um, Lieutenant Kurt Bossart to join us here at the last um, moment to talk a little bit about the course that I advertised just a moment ago. And so I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Kurt and Vanessa uh, to give us a little plug about this upcoming uh, online course, Law Enforcement Through Restorative Justice, Peace Building in the Community. Uh, we've advertised it a little bit before we started the conversation with Vanessa. And now that you've tasted a bit of the conversation with Vanessa, you'll have an idea of what, what's in store for this course. We'd love for folks to sign up for this and get your friends and colleagues to also join. Um, Kurt, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you talk a little bit about um, your vision for the course and Vanessa. Sure. Thank you. We have a uh, six-part course coming up, and it's going to be on restorative justice and law enforcement, and it's really going to be centering around uh, how, to, how to implement restorative justice within law enforcement, within agencies, and within the community. And I think it's going to be very interactive. It's going to be uh, really good as far as just really showing different aspects of how restorative justice practices can be embraced within police agencies. 
um, incorporating the community. And I think it's going to be um, an opportunity for people to really see the, the value for restorative justice as, as an option uh, within for police in the community. Vanessa, do you have anything to add there on that? Vanessa, you might need to be unmuted. There we I go. <laughs> I found you. What could I add to that? Um, wow, it's, it's, it's actually, I think it's going to be an interactive kind of learning space um, because traditionally law enforcement doesn't look at restorative justice as an option. And then the restorative justice community doesn't believe that law enforcement has the space. They're like, you're the part of the system. But we want the same things. So I think this is going to be kind of a adventure and, and how we could probably learn together. Um, the Zare Institute has done some extensive work around this. Um, I believe this is our opportunity um, with the good Lieutenant, my hero, um, retired and just ready to roll to really, you know, um, bring a, a lens or a view to how these two worlds really connect. Right. And if and, and then, you know, not using the bridge and the divide, so to speak, but then, you know, but yeah, how how do you, you know, connect these two worlds? Because they're needful and necessary. And, you know, just doing the th same thing all the time at the same time, expecting the same results. Yeah. Y'all know what that means. Right. So um, I, I'm excited. I'm excited, you know, um, to be a part, I'm, you know, is excited that the lieutenant let me hang out for a little while, and I'm believing that we all are going to learn something new. I think the other thing too is this, we're going to be looking at um, implementation throughout the country. So we're going to look at different organizations, different police departments that have already been practicing restorative justice, and we're going to look at, at those um, programs and and try to explore and see how individual communities can actually incorporate this for themselves and, and have the flexibility with restorative justice. Kurt, maybe you want to say just a little bit about how you got into RJ and then we'll move on to uh, the rest of our, our, our time. We've heard, we've had some good stories from Vanessa. Maybe you want to say a little bit for our, for our participants. How did you get into RJ? Absolutely. I, I had the opportunity to attend the Southern Police Institute at the University of Louisville. And, and there we learned a lot about research. We learned a lot about uh, looking at studies and, and asking questions about why are we doing what we're doing. And when I returned back to Harrisonburg, Virginia, at my home and, and the organization that I work for, I was asked if I would look at restorative justice as an option for the police department. And so I started getting into it, not knowing anything about it. And then as soon as I started learning what restorative justice is, it was that light bulb moment for me. It was that, it was that ah moment. And, and I could see where this is the missing piece of what we've really been needing law enforcement uh, to really reach out and, and meet with the community and deal with the situations and issues that we're dealing with nationwide. And so from there, it's just been a, um, it's been a great experience learning more and getting involved. And we now have a coalition in Harrisonburg, community-wide coalition, where we're, uh, we've implemented restorative justice, not only within the police department, but throughout the community. And we're using it right now for crimes, uh, pre-charge, and uh, both adult, juvenile, uh, felony, and misdemeanor, and um, with with pretty good success. So we're we're growing, we're learning, but boy, it's it's been a great experience for us, and it's really built a lot of capital within the community. And I think that's that's an important part of it as well. Fantastic, folks. So there you have it. Um, please sign up, get your friends and colleagues in. We'd love to. Um, see this this take off we're hoping that it's a conversation that's time has come and we've got two excellent folk with a lot of experience who will be facilitating this process so um take down the information uh and sign up yourself or find those you know who might benefit from this and uh, we'll look forward to having this conversation online later this summer i'm going to turn it now over to um Kajungu. Uh, our graduate assistant to take us through a few more announcements about, around opportunities to get involved with restorative justice, further training, and um, the work of Zare Institute. Kajungu? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to emphasize about the uh, advertisement uh, that I just made today. 
just go to our website at the end of our, our, our slide for more information and registration. It is a very cool a program and you learn a lot from people who have been in the field. Addition from that, I have a couple announcements coming. Uh, we have some of this building SPI. Uh, there are a lot of courses will be offered and uh, three of them are indicated on a slide over there. Please, for more information, visit our website as it showed at the slide at the end over there. We have a restorative justice online course. We start August 29 uh, to December 15, 20, 2017. Uh, that will be instructed by Dr. Johan Chuna. For more information, please register for the um, website down there and uh, or email direct to the image which you showed over there. The good thing about this course, you can take this course while you continue with your daily activities because it is online uh, program. STAR, which is Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. It is offered here at EMU. Please, there's two levels, level one and the level two. All of them, both of them are offered at EMU. Again, visit our website down there for more information and registration. The Restorative Justice Graduate Certificate, it allow working professional to continue working while complete uh, their studies. Uh, it helps to reflect on your work and increase your knowledge and the skills. This certificate may be all you need to, to, to liberalize your vision and the work. For more information again about this, please visit our website that indicated down there. Let's start with just in education. This is a very good program for those who are involved in education program, school. It helps how to intervene or to include uh, restorative justice in our academic life. So please again visit our website for more information and the registration. EMU CJP is offering a master's uh, in conflict and transformation and also this is a practice-based curriculum exploring nonviolent and restorative responses to conflict, uh, foster reflective values-based practice and a critical self-reflection. More information about this course please visit our website as it indicated at the bottom. But additionally from that, I just want to indicate CJ, uh, CJP has started a program, it's called Restorative Justice Masters this year. All of that information you can find in our website at, as, as it indicated at this slide. And this is uh, the end of my announcement. I want to take it back to Carl for the close remarks. Thank you. So thank you everyone who has been able to join us. I think if, if at least I certainly felt like we had a very stimulating conversation. I hope it's brought some hope, it's brought some new ideas and um, brought some revigoration to continue uh, our important work. We are in a climate and in a society where restorative justice is more necessary, more urgent than it's probably ever been. Um, and so I'm really thankful that we've been able to have this conversation. I'm really thankful um, grateful for Vanessa taking the time out of her schedule. She's actually traveling somewhere, right? I think you're in training right now. So thank you for taking the time to be with us, share your wisdom and your experience. And uh, we wish you all the best as you continue this important, very important restorative work. Thank you all of you who joined us. And um, we'll be taking a break on our webinars over the summer, which we usually do, and be picking them back up in the fall. Uh, with the hope that we'll be looking in the fall at a theme of transforming historical harms through restorative justice processes. And uh, so look forward to that uh, series in the fall, and uh, you'll see some of those advertisements coming out on our websites. Uh, please join us, be in touch, get a hold of us if you've got any questions, and uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. And again, we'll have this recorded and up uploaded in, in a few uh, working days. And uh, if you would like others to hear this webinar, lead them to, uh, direct them towards uh, our, our website and they will be able to find the recording there. All the best as you continue with your work in restorative justice and practice. Vanessa, thank you again. And for everyone else who's been with us, have a good evening.